So, <coughs> I did not have a more. My name is John O'Hanlon. I'm doing research on the O'Hanlons. In the church in Dunmore, a new church was built in 1832. And J.J. O'Hanlon, who was born in 1821, wrote a book called The History of Catholicity in the Carolinas. And in that book, he talks about going to Mass in the new church as an 11 year old. And he was very, very, very impressed by the priests, the press specimens, and the whole situation. And he was determined that he would be a priest. He spoke to his father and all the members of the family. And there was a cousin of his who was a presentation nun. And she listened to what he had to say. And she said, Bishop England, whose sister is a presentation nun, is Bishop of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, part of Florida, and he has responsibility for the Caribbean. That was his diocese. He mentioned this much. North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and part of the Caribbean. So Bishop England took J.J. O'Connell in a way on his own. And J.J. was ordained in 1844. And I just want to get the details correct now because so uh, uh, he's ordained in 1844 in Savannah and Georgia. And his ministry, he had a, served his ministry in South Carolina, North Carolina. So very early on in his time in America, he contacted his parents at home. And he said, this is the land of opportunity. I presume this is what he said. Come out here. So the complete O'Connell family emigrated to South Carolina before the family. One brother stayed at home, married at home, and had a large family. And that brother and wife and children, the oldest at six months, were evicted from the war in 1850. J.J. O'Connell, the guy that became a priest, worked, slaved, I suppose, almost, in North Carolina and South Carolina. And in 1871, uh, his health suffered. He was a priest in this district. He was, remember, crossing rivers, boats, no roads, and so on. And in 1874, he retired from the priesthood. And, in, and he bought 500 acres of land after the Civil War. And he paid $10 for 500 acres. And he contacted the Benedictines and he asked them to consult and to build a monastery there. And they opened Belmont Monastery and Belmont College in North Carolina. He became a lay brother and he began his studies then and his research into Catholicity in the Carolinas. And in that book, just I have read it, just in that book there are a few sentences which caught my attention. And I followed those sentences. And uh, that's what this lecture is about. Just a small sentence in that book and what it opened brought from a historical point of view. It's not genealogy, you know, it's a start. Okay? <clears throat> Now, I have to press this, I think, Tim, is that right? Yeah. A buccaneer and court priest who ended up ministering in the Americas in the mid 19th century. His name was Reverend William Clancy. He was born in 1802 in the Banyan area. He attended St. Patrick's College, Carlo, Patrick's College in Lewis, and he was ordained in 1823. Now, two very important dates there. 1802, 1823. He was ordained at 21. He ministered in the Diocese of Cork, possibly Ballinassi, but not 100% sure. And he was appointed professor in St. Patrick's College, Carlow, in 1829. Consecrated titular bishop of Charleston, North Carolina, in Carlow Cathedral in 1844. 
so he was going out to help Bishop John Eagle. He arrived in Charleston a year later. Arrived in Georgetown, British Guyana, in 1837. He was removed from position there in 1843, and he died in 1847. That's just a brief account of his life. We'll go through his life now in more detail. He was concentrated in Cabo, and three months later he requested travel expenses before traveling to Carolina. Right in Latin to Rome, he lamented, everyone in Ireland knows that my going out to the American region is an exchange almost for the worst. <laughs> if the Holy Father insists, I shall go with a heavy heart. After the great sacrifice I have made for God, the Roman Curia, and the Bishop of Charleston in exchanging my homeland, tranquility, family, and sufficient means of support for a foreign country, hardships, long journeys, and poverty. So that was his first message as it were. He pulled every stop that he constantly could in stop going. Short sight, lack of money, pending future transfer request, he borrowed money from the bishop's brother, Bishop England's brother. He borrowed money from him. He was waiting for student curates, he said, to take out with him. He finally arrived in North Carolina in November 35, almost a year late. I did not come seeking gold or power. There is less of either in this wilderness of a diocese than in all of Christendom. Now, at that particular time, Frederick Lucas established a Catholic paper in England called the Tablet. And he was looking for news. He wanted actors to write. So Clancy said, there's this guy going to write all that I want. So he continued to contribute to the tablet in England. And that's where a lot of this will come from. March 26, he asked Rome for a release as he had too little to do. Rome rebuked him, but he persisted. I would prefer any diocese in America or Great Britain to my present connection with Charleston. It is too bad that I should be sent on a voyage of discovery to the old and the new world. In desperation, Bishop England sent him to Haiti in his own role to prevent him doing further damage. Will you recall? No, Bishop England was also, as I said, in charge of the Caribbean. North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, part of Florida, <coughs> So he sent him there, but he called him because he prevented him from doing further damage. He wrote to the Pope, Bishop John England, in 37. And this is what he said, Clancy is the best of men, and we are the best of friends, which I do not want to keep him unhappy. He is very distinguished for his character, zeal and piety. But in one year, he has wrecked the whole constitutional system of church government, which has taken the years to work out. So whatever poor old Bishop England had been doing had been wrecked the minute Nancy arrived on the scene. Central player in a lot of this is Pope Gregory. He set out to evangelize a second new world in the foyer left by the collapse of the Catholic, Spanish, and French empires. The Pope created over 17 new vicariates, or missions run by bishops, answerable directly to propaganda fide in Rome. One apostolic vicariate was London, capital of a growing empire, where in 1829 Catholics had finally been granted civic recognition. Now, the appointment of a bishop would be subject to the British Parliament. <coughs> so, the way they got around that, they appointed vicariates. <laughs> And they were directly responsible to Rome, not to the local church. Summer of 37, Rome finally ordered Bishop Clancy to British Diana. And the Pope nominated John Hines, a Dominican friar in Rome, as Bishop England's new assistant bishop in Charleston, North Carolina. Hines was formerly in Georgetown. Guyana. So there's a swap. Hines goes from, from Guyana 
the North Carolina. North Carolina plans of course to British Guyana. Heinz was also a native of Rock, and sometimes gave Clancy hospitality at the Dominican house in Cork. It's amazing the three central characters in this apartment, which bring them Clancy and Heinz. On his return to Cork, having been appointed to British Guyana, Clancy visited the Dominican Priory and went into Heinz's room. He copied a confidential report on the state of the Catholic Church in British Guyana, compiled by Heinz, who had worked there for eight years. He opened the papal seal brief, paper, the seal paper brief to Bishop England. When England received the letter with the broken seal, he assumed Heinz and Clancy were conspiring and refused Heinz as his assistant. Clancy then had the gall to ask Rome to appoint Heinz as his assistant. So when Heinz went out to North Carolina with the broken seal, the bishop refused it because he thought there was some skullduggery going on between Clancy and Heinz. British Diana, the most drink sodden and depressing colonial mission in the British Empire. Georgetown, the capital, is on the Demerara estuary. Demerara, anybody have an idea? Sugar. 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 The richest of sugar. The best of sugar. So that was the place where they got the best sugar in the world. And to get the best sugar, what do you get? Alcohol. <laughs> the governor was Sir Henry Light, a devout and tolerant Anglican. And he had given church sites in Georgetown and New Amsterdam to John Hines O.P. And the governor gave a stipend relative to the number of Catholics in the colony. The governor said, you're all preaching the gospel of Christ. Why should I so offend the Anglican church only? I would also help the Catholic church relative to the number of people in your community. He did the same with the Methodists, you know, and I'm just taking this one as such. Okay? That's British Guyana, long and narrow on the Atlantic Ocean. In spite of Rome's orders, Clancy engages on a lecture tour of Ireland and mainland Europe. He seems to have been preoccupied with money and once concentrated with being an apostolic ruler. His regular reports to the tablet spoke of his officiating in full pontificals and both of conversations amongst those of spending. The title that he professed to be the best, the titular Bishop of Rienze, Vicar Apostolic of British Guyana, Count of the Holy Roman Empire, and P.P. of George. So he had to be addressed in those terms. Right? Very humble man, you can see. It. On arrival in 48, he found all ready to work with him to promote the stability and spread of the church. He brought six curates with him, including the Reverend Eugene McNamara. His brother, Dr. Francis Clancy, was the chief medical officer there, and they were favorably received by all classes. Now, he brought six curates with him because he had the plan. Now, Heinz said he had 4,000 Catholics. And the governor gave him 500 pounds, their votes. Clancy said he had 8,000. So he was looking for more money. The governor said, Clan and Heinz has been here for the previous eight years. I know he has only 4,000. Where did the other 4 come from? But Clancy said he's gone out to Europe to get priests for the 8,000 people. And he brought six curates with him. Okay? Not any six curates. With six curates that all had got exiates. No, who's the expert here? What's an exiate? What's an exit? Uh, surely you know what an exit is. Way out. Huh? Way out. Oh, way out. An exiate? Go out and don't come back. <laughs> right? So he got six curates that were expelled from the diocese that they had been in. Right? He promised them 
the best of living in British Guyana, good money opportunities, so on, so on, so on. So he got six of those. One of them, McNamara. We'll be coming back to McNamara later. The statement was at 555, which Clancy was to divide between himself and his curates. But when he argued that 8,000 Catholics were only eight curates, the governor allowed to counter that there were 4,600 Catholics justifying only four curates. Clancy reported him to the colonial office in London as the biggest Tory planter. <laughs> so he complained him to the colonial service. 1841, he's on the move again. Came to Cork from London and Rome with permission to recruit nuns, including his cousin, Abigail Canton, a presentation nun. Abigail had helped establish the convent in Wimbledon, but she was recalled to North Prison in 1840. There was some odd bit of problem in Wimbledon, and she was brought back to head office. While Bishop England was visiting her sister, his sister Mary England in North Press, Bishop Clancy assisted Abigail Canton to leave the convent. Now the Reverend Mother refused permission to go, but he brought a horse and cab outside the North Press, and Abigail went over the wall. And off she went with helping Clancy. And she helped recruit other nuns from Port Leisure and Carlo. So she went around in Ireland looking for nuns, novices, to go over to British Guyana. The tablet was full of praise for Clancy, giving education to the people out there, schooling, so on, for young girls, and so on. And he was, uh, the tablet was delighted with all this information, of course, because of sending the paper for him and expanding and exposing his reading tree. Guyana was the devil by drink. Two of the priests, Nightingale and McNamara, were found on natural civil limits to remind them of the pledge they had taken in Ireland. Clancy and three fellow curates became addicted. Clancy's judgment faltered. He called the colonial secretary and mere layman and not my equal in spiritual or chemical matters. He demanded precedence over the Anglican and Archdeacon and all the guests walked There was an official dinner. He said, I'm more important than the Archdeacon and the Anglican Bishop. And they all don't want to see only the pen picture of her. That's how October 1841, the yeah, informed tablet in London, nuns of the presentation order to immediately take possession of a large and commodious building. They were the first to be ordered and established on the great continent of South America. He said they were running six free schools. On that date, we made a decline. Date from, from that date, we made date of the decline of the Catholic Church in 1842. That's a report in propaganda theory. Now, the tablet is promoting what it realizes is possibly true. Clancy is using that. We must also remember that we're talking 1842, communication is not instantaneous, you have to get a ship, send a message out to Rome or to London or wherever. So, all of this can be happening in the back of the world. So, that's the first Catholic church and presbytery in British Guyana. That's the size of the church and presbytery you can see them there. <clears throat> so, in the presbytery, this is a report known in, that went to Rome. In this house, the bishop took up his residence day and night, not in any distant apartments, but in the very centre. The sleeping apartment of the superiors being on the same floor as that of the bishop. The door locked with communication by a staircase, staircase the dormitories of, of the other ladies, situated on another floor, and no admittance given to the other sisters. <laughs> so the presbytery was divided in two, we said. Did we have a job of sacrifices? The presbytery was divided in two. The bishop and the superior on floor one, 
and they could go down to the or area where the nuns were, but the nuns could go up. <laughs> right? So in 1842, he had been working very, 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 very difficult life, strenuous and so on. He decided that himself and the superior should go to the sulfur waters in Nevis in the Caribbean for a holiday. <laughs> so, and, and Aurelian himself off they went to the Caribbean. <laughs> News returned to Diana before he did that he and Regan had stayed in the same house on Nevis. <laughs> on return, Clancy found his flock scandalized at the intimacy and the petition was signed and addressed to Rome for his removal. Now nobody could prove that anything was happening upstairs in, in the present, right? but the two men can off to never snow it. This is next year, 1842, he booked into Ford's Hotel in the aristocratic part of London's West End. And it, that was his base for six months of official leave. In Rome, in Lent 1843, he attended 10, 11 other bishops around the papal throne on Easter Sunday. He requested six months' extension from the colonial office until the end of 1843, but the colonial office informed him that he had until August to return to qualify for his government salary. If he wanted money, that would work. That's on base. In Rome, John Hollins, the guy who had been appointed to North Carolina, is now without a bishop. Well, he's a bishop without a diocese. And he knew that propaganda he did that's in Rome had demanded Clancy to resign. And Clancy was to stay in Rome. But in June 1843, the Royal Demerara Gazette announced that Reverend Mr. McNamara and Reverend Mr. MacDonald are immediately proceeding to Rome to lay before the Pope the degraded and unhappy state of this diocese. <clears throat> so Clancy is told to stay in Rome, and two of the priests that are dominating British Diana decide they'd better go to Rome to deliver the message in person. McNamara was sober because he stayed in the village, and MacDonald was a carry man who was an alcoholic, but decided that he would give up the drink. And he did, and su succeeded. And eventually, MacDonald died on the fashion ship, on the famine ships to Canada. He became a curator for a chaplain on those famine ships, and he died on one. So McNamara and MacDonald went to Rome to give a first hand account to Rome. In August, the Pope appoints Heinz as administrator of Guyana. So Heinz is now appointed to go back to British Guyana. Clancy is supposed to stay in Rome. Clancy, on hearing this, he made for England as fast as he could, and he arrived in Guyana on the 12th of September in time to obtain the arrears of half salary from his extended leave, so it's in time to get the money. He wrote to the tablet, the English paper, that he was repairing to the colony with all speed to protect the ladies of the convent <laughs> against future aggressions from Hines and his agents, MacDonald and McNamara. So now he is, he is the first shopping. He's getting back as fast as he can to protect the poor nuns because of McNamara and MacDonald and Hines. When Clancy reached Georgetown, Lucas decided to lift his news blackboard and went on to reveal that Dr. Clancy has had no jurisdiction over British Diana since February 43. So the paper now has blown Clancy's cover. Up and all, the tablet was taken by Clancy told okay. On the 10th of November, McNamara and MacDonald arrived back in Diana with letters of dismissal for Clancy. They informed the governor that Heinz was the new apostolic figure. A majority of Catholics supported Clancy and he controlled church property. He controlled the church and the convent. 
When they approached Hensi, MacDonald, he threatened them with the shillelagh and drove them out of the church. <laughs> and he informed the congregation that Heinz had no <coughs> jurisdiction whatsoever. Now, Heinz is in London waiting for permission to travel to British Guyana. But Clancy was in the colonial office before he got there. And Clancy said, I am the the real Jew, I am the real bishop, this other guy is an emperor. <coughs> and any time Heinz approached the colonial office for permission to go to British Guyana, he was rejected. Eventually, he sent a letter to Lord Stanley and said, Look, this is the situation, and Lord Stanley gave him permission to travel to British Guyana. He finally arrived in Guyana in July and lodged in the Anglican Bishop's house. He stayed at the Anglican Bishop. And in July, I sent a message to Dr. Clancy to surrender the church, and I received a flat refusal. A meeting of Catholics to consider our next move. So they called the Catholics in the colony to see what was the next move. He sent a report of meeting to Rome, Paris, Ireland, and the newspapers. John Heinz sent a message to Rome, Paris, and Irish newspapers. Or the newspapers. He preached in the old court house in July, and he had listened to listen to the complaints of the Negroes who charged Dr. Clancy with taking $300 from them for building a church that was never built. So he was still getting money, promising this letter. In September, Hines petitioned the governor for the use of troops to repossess the church. He asked for troops to take over the church, and the governor refused. He was not going to get involved in this battle. On the 15th of November, some observers saw Clancy leave the house, go from the house to the church. And a person went to the house to ask him for honor or to business. And he left the church room unattended. The doors were open. And Heinz and his supporters rushed in and took possession of the church. Clancy attacked them with a massive bludgeon and he had to be disarmed. Heinz and two others forced the gate and captured the presbytery. The police came to restore order. A week after he surrendered the keys of the church, Clancy sailed to Nevis with Anna Morgan's. <laughs> For the next 18 months, Clancy and the nuns maintained a separate congregation next door. So they only half the press, they had the church and half the press, the nuns and the rest of it, and Clancy was in control of that. The nuns wrote to Rome for the reinstatement of Clancy. April 46. Most of his followers returned to the church and made a public apology to Heinz. Clancy advised his remaining followers to join the Methodists. Anybody that was still loyal to him, he took them up to the Methodists and asked them to join the Methodists, rather than submit to Heinz. On the 11th of April, he went in a hired cock gate to pay his farewell visit, and dawn five days later, Clancy drove to Gloves. He, he had been broke, but he showed his short sum of furniture in the convent to make enough money from the fair to get back to Ireland. So he's back in Ireland. In Cork, he was a chief celebrant at the funeral mass for Archdeacon O'Keefe on the 1847, and Catholic administrator of coffee on the June 47. So he's back now in full pontificals, uh, participating and uh, doing the prayers at these. He joined. He died in June 47, and in Cork, in the crypt in the north. Of the during renovations in 1960, the bones of those interred were transferred to St. Henry's Cemetery. In his will, he left 1,500 to the presentation sisters. The North Press refused the request, and it was transferred to him. <laughs> so he acknowledged this. Right? Okay. And then, you must remember, communications from one side of the world to the other. 
accept it for pontificals, masses and everything, saying masses that drive back to the colonies, having kicked over as it were. Okay? And that's the headstone thing also in our cathedral, way down the bottom, there are all our people that were interred there. And that's in Reverend William Clancy, Bishop of Chancellor. Okay? No, there's our Kensey in the early church bishops were here, there, and everywhere. So dioceses that have fallen and were no longer there, those dioceses were given to people that like Chancy. It was an ancient diocese, but it no longer existed in that sense. And that's his brother who's, who's buried with own hair like uh, in uh, that's his brother who's also in the country. Okay? It's the headstone inside the church chamber. Abigail Cantonan. She was a cousin of Bishop Clancy. She had established a convent in Vilgen. In 1840, she was recalled by Mary England, the superior, who felt, and it was only known to put this work, to put these words together, that she was unsettled and unsettled. So she was removed from the convent in Vilgen and brought back to Mount Prince. Bishop Clancy visited the Cork Convent, but the Reverend Mother would not release Cantonan because she thought her liable to an infringement of her vows and rules. So Bishop uh, Mother England would not release her. Later, Clancy hired a cab and conducted Cantonan out of the convent. We had that already, okay? She began recruiting for the new convent in Guyana, sisters from Caroline to Felicia. The sisters worked in Guyana for many years. Bishop Hines wrote, for the little edification which you have given to the people of Guyana, you are all to depart. So the new bishop sent them all away. Cantillon eventually went to Rome to keep her meal and spent the rest of her days in Middleton. North Prez, from which she had grown with Clancy, to have her back. Okay? So I need, uh, let's go back one. No, that's it. So that's the first section of what I'm talking about. If there are any questions, then I'll answer them. I know it's gone through very little bit. A bit confusing, is it? <laughs> It's not okay. Or surprising and confusing. What? Or surprising and confusing. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. No. Earlier on, I spoke of the time of the Spanish Empire. And the Spanish were very, very much afraid of an invasion from the Pacific on their Spanish possessions in South America. So that's what I'm just going to go now. Rochelle in 1728 29, Catherine the Great sent the British spelling to explore her eastern land. So after 5,900 miles, they reached the North Pacific. And Bering made quite a number of trips from, let's say, St. Petersburg all across Siberia out to the Pacific. And the, the, the Russians between 1733 and 1743, they sent 10,000 men to map and explore the west coast of America. We know they went into Alaska, we know they went into San Francisco, Hawaii, Antarctica. They were the first to name islands in Antarctica, the Russians. We don't think of that, but that. So the Spanish were very, very much afraid that they could come from the Pacific to their Spanish possessions. The English. California was called Nova Albion. was the name of the continental area north of Mexico claimed by Sir Francis Drake in 17, uh, 1579. So the British prepared all of that territory from Mexico north into Canada as British territory. They disputed the border between Canada and the US they fought back and so forth. No, they were, they were, the Americans went north into Canada. We know about the Fenians who went in there. But the Americans always invaded. And some Canadians 
Hemet, uh, what we know are the United States, claiming territory. The border was not defined. So the Spanish were very much afraid of those two, the Russians and the English. So the Spanish missionaries were, went there in 1769 and went on to establish 21 missions. And then we know the names. San Diego, San Jose, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and so on. So there are 20, 21 Franciscan missions all along the California coast, which was called Alta California, Northern California. And the Secularization Act of 1833 saw the transfer of the missions to military commanders. So the missions were closed down effectively in 1833. And military commanders were put in them. And the military commanders were very, very disjointed. So the whole area was open for colonization. It was very, very, very important. Alta California in 1846. On the 7th of July, 1846, 200 American Marines and sailors landed at Monterey. They commandeered. The commander read in Spanish and English the former proclamation of American rule. A hundred miles to the north, all of this happened in the one year ago. At Sonoma, American settler squadrons <coughs> declared independence from Mexico at Suffer's Hall. They raised a flag at the Texas as an independent state. And the third item, which we'll be dealing with, 300 miles to the south in Los Angeles, the Mexican California Departmental Assembly, in extraordinary session, discussed and approved a single item agenda. The McNamara Conference. So these three things happened at the same time in 1846. The Americans invade. They, 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 there's, there's no invasion because there's no way to, to defeat a declared war on uh, The settlers and then McNamara. And who is McNamara? Uh, uh, sorry, we'll come back to that. Eugene McNamara was born in Carlton County Clare, 1814. Began his study for the priesthood in the Irish College in Rome in 1832. He was dismissed in 1834. Within two years of training for priesthood, he was dismissed. But he went back, and in 1837, he completed his training in the Missionary College of the Picpus Fathers in Paris. So he's known in all the Indians. He was appointed curate in QP, Dunbeg, and to Barthes in 1840, where he took the place from Father Metro. Early in 1841, he was transferred to Carlton, and he was removed in March to the famous term, exit, goodbye, and won't come back. And he met Clancy in London, and Clancy told him about all the prospects that were there for him in British Guyana, so off he went with Clancy, as did five others we mentioned. It. Clancy had six now, Clancy had one, or McNamara's one. He, he had been dismissed from, uh, Clancy has gone now from British Guyana, so Clancy, three weeks out of Guyana, he arrived in Mexico, McNamara did. Just as President Santa Ana was deposed, Santa Ana had lost Texas. There was panic all over the place in Mexico. The Texans had humiliated Santa Ana, and Alta California could well be taken from Mexico. Northern California was right to be taken. In Mexico City, McNamara called the Catholic Primate with a letter of introduction from Bishop Hines. So the new Bishop of British Diana gave McNamara a letter of introduction to the Archbishop of Mexico. And the primate made McNamara apostolic missionary. And 
his parish was Alta California. So McNamara is known the parish priest of that California, Northern California district. Okay? McNamara had informed the primate of the famine in Ireland, especially in his native county Clare. Prior Jose Maria's Morales de Real also conveyed a third share of a mercury mine to McNamara. Now the mining in California gold hadn't been found yet. So mercury is the mine, the, the, the precious mine. He also got a land grant from the Mexican McNamara did and land title to 20,000 square miles of Mexican California. So McNamara now has mining rights, his parish priest of the Ultra California, and he has 20,000 square miles of California. And through one thing and another, it's increased to 13.3 million acres of California. So McNamara now has proof papers entitling him to 13.3 million acres of California. The land had to be occupied in five years, and the land then, with Irish people from there, and remember, they're Catholics, and the Mexicans would want Catholics on their northern border there. So now McNamara is given permission to bring Irish Catholics from there to settle in California. This would be a strong bastion against U.S. squatters and Mojave raiders. The U.S. presidents did not want the Ireland band of British influence around the USA. The U.S. government did not want British settlers or the or English colonizers in California. They already had enough trouble with them in Canada, so they did not want them on their western border. The Oregon crisis and the McNamara scheme, this is the debate in Washington, were a deliberate design to surround us with British colonies and to shut us out of the Pacific and its commerce. It's debated in Washington, D.C. And this is one of the statements made during the debate about it. When R. McNamara received his patents, Washington was aware of this within five days. When McNamara got his 13 million acres, five days later, they knew it was they were determined there was no way. No one must remember that McNamara is British. They don't see the truth. In 1846, the U.S. declared war against Mexico. The U.S. recognized McNamara's claim. They were prepared to honor the claim of 13 million acres to McNamara, but they couldn't find it. Okay? In 1842-48, gold was found in Alta California. The warders rushed in 1848 and stampeded in there in 1849. California was now to McNamara's reach, and Mexico had little to offer. Spurred by continuous relentless famine reports from Ireland, he sailed for Chile. In 1848, he launched a petition, a colony petition, in Santiago de Chile. So he launched a request for land in Chile in 1848. President Manuel Bolles turned to Europe for colonizers. He wanted colonizers. Congress had allocated him 8,000 colonizing zones in western Patagonia. So McNamara now has got land in Chile. Patagonia for settlers. The Interior Minister issued detailed instructions to Don Eugenio McNamara to settle 3,000 Irish families there. A permission to have 3,000 Irish families there. Irish settlers had to take Chilean citizenship. Chile would salary two priests, two teachers, and a doctor, all with 42 acre bonuses. So it was a fairly detailed 
detailed um, process of completion. Nothing is known of McNamara's movements between Chile in 1848 and he arrived in France in December 1851. He died in Paris in January 1852, days after the U.S. Land Commission convened in California. In March, I made a deliberate proceeding in the case that Eugene McNamara had died and left a sum of 1.2 million francs. His only surviving brother was located and he became the sole beneficiary. So his brother ended up with about 48,000 in 1850. This is fair. Fair amount of money in that one. Okay. Just a brief resume of his life. He was suspended three times in three years. So he was suspended in the house of Tillerou. He was descended. He was uh, suspended from the British Guyana. And the worst person all was Bishop Clancy. And then Hines had no choice but to dismiss him. He was assertive with a gift of persuasive conversation with initiative enough to sail 8,000 miles to see the Pope and to have their two presidents of Mexico in their duty to help him get his way. So he was a fairly persuasive type of person. And this British diplomats, merchants, and bondholders supported him. He was backed by the Royal Navy. McNamara personified at the highest levels a political and commercial conspiracy between Britain and Mexico against the US. And that's that. All right.